a country with an authentic history that dates back to about 23 centuries before the birth of Christ. And it has often been referred to as the sleeping giant of Asia. But in modern times, it has been awakened with a political upheaval that has shattered her foundations to the breaking point. This is Piping or Peking, whichever you prefer to call it. But to the Orthodox Chinaman, it is the imperial city of old China. Here at the Central Railroad Station, we learn that the first railroad tracks were laid in China in 1876, and they covered a distance of only 12 miles from Shanghai to Wusun. The government was soon obliged to rip out the tracks to appease the superstitious clamor of the people. Trouble and strife, however, have since taught the Chinese the value of a country's railway system. China was a civilized nation when the rest of the countries of the Western Hemisphere were inhabited by barbarians. And through much of its history of old dynasties, Piping was the capital city and the home of emperors. But in 1928, when the nationalists captured Piping, they immediately transferred the capital and the center of government to Nanking. In the crowded streets, life keeps company with death and funerals like this may be seen at any hour of the day. The fact that the Chinese consider death more important than life accounts for the apparent lack of grief at this funeral. The deceased has been provided with paper representations of food, clothes, money, and everything that he is supposed to need in his life beyond the grave. We can understand this philosophy of life and death when we see the pitiful plight of the poorer classes. And it is even more pathetic when we realize that about one-fifth of the world's total population lives in China. The rising generation, however, seems to be of a more hopeful disposition. The street sprinklers are constantly at work using the same system that was inaugurated here centuries ago. Piping is actually four walled cities the North or Tartar city, the South or Chinese city, the Imperial city, and this section known as the Forbidden City, which is entered through four gates, North, South, East, and West. It was in the Forbidden City and in the parks just outside Piping that the Ming emperors and the Manchus built many of their grandest palaces and temples. But it was not until after the Boxer Rebellion in 1900 that the foreigners were allowed to enter this hallowed ground. The Temple of Heaven, where the emperor once worshipped, was formerly one of China's most sacred shrines. But changing conditions are dispensing with the austere formalities that were reverently associated with this ancient landmark. Here we are greeted by an old priest who cordially directs us to the altar of heaven another sacred shrine which is located a short distance from the temple. Here on the 21st of each December, the emperor came to pray for his people. The altar itself is located on a marble terrace made up of nine concentric circles, the innermost of which was considered to be the center of the universe. The Chinese guide explains all this to us in broken but eloquent English. Back in the streets of Peking, we, we pause for a moment to watch this Chinese barber at work. haircut isn't exactly the current fashion for Chinese men in the large cities. Many of the old timers prefer the traditional style set by their forefathers. We haven't time for a haircut, so we continue on to the summer palace in the suburbs of Piping, where the Empress Dowager maintained her residence to avoid the heat of the city. 
Here in the palatial buildings and pleasure gardens, she lavished all that art could create and money could buy. Returning to the Imperial City, we passed the Winter Palace, which was formerly occupied by the President of the Chinese Republic. Perhaps the highlight of a visit to Piping is a side journey to the Great Wall of China. During our 40-mile journey by rail to this famous wall, we noticed many examples of the old Chinese manners and customs, such as the native women whose feet were bound when they were babies, because tiny feet were then considered a great mark of culture and beauty. Fortunately, this practice was legally forbidden long ago. The little children are obviously afraid of cameras, for it is their belief that they will lose their faces if they allow them to be photographed. Even their elders are not too comfortable when the camera eye is pointed at them. The railway runs to within a mile of the Great Wall. And then we continue on burrows in sedan chairs or on foot. Our camera equipment is carried on the backs of these tiny, sure-footed animals. tiresome climb, but the thought of seeing one of the seven wonders of the ancient world urges us on. We pass many interesting types along the way. This old man seems to reflect the age of the wall itself. Now at last we come upon one of the greatest achievements ever recorded in the annals of man, the Great Wall of China stretching like a mighty dragon over the hills and valleys of this ancient land for a distance of nearly 2,000 miles. Construction was begun 300 years before Christ to help in keeping out invaders from Mongolia, and in the 15th century it was extended by 300 miles. The terrific gale of wind which constantly sweeps across the wall makes us marvel all the more that it has so well endured the onslaught of the elements. It seems to parallel the history of China itself, for she too has withstood the ravages of time and the political whims of her people, even though her present problems seem to be more than she can endure. Nevertheless, the history of this ancient country reveals that it has never been conquered through force of arms, although it has been subjected to invasion and civil strife since the beginning of recorded history. Like quicksand, in the end, China seems to absorb all who would change the pattern of her existence. And this is the thought that we take with us as we bid farewell to China and her imperial city.